morning. I'm Erica Allen. I'm one of the pastors here at Horizon Church. Uh, ground zero. Ground zero. Especially on this morning, those words probably remind you of something, right? Ground zero. It's officially the place where destruction begins. So when there's some kind of traumatic event or some kind of explosion or something happens, ground zero is that point where the destruction happens. 21 years ago, almost at this exact time, most of us were in some place and ground zero took on a whole new meaning, right? It became what we referred to as the rubble and destruction, the ruins that laid where the World Trade Centers would, once stood proudly in New York City. Ground zero. If we can, for just a moment, I'd like for us to begin this message w just with a prayer. God, we thank you so much that on this morning, 21 years after September 11th, 2001, we are together in this room Worshiping you, God, a God of hope and restoration, a God who renews and repairs and renovates. And I pray this morning, God, that we'll have the courage to look at the ground zeros in our lives and trust you to be the God who you've proven yourself to be over and over and over again, a renovating, repairing, renewing God. We are here this morning to hear from you. Amen. So for just a moment, for just a moment, I'd like you to think about the ground zero in your own life. Those moments when by surprise and total shock something happened and you know what it's like to stand there and look at the rubble that once was a life built proudly in front of people that you liked. Your two feet are, were standing in the rubble. Think of that ground zero in your own life. And I want you to hear this. If you don't hear anything else I have to say this morning, I want you to hear this. We serve a God who is renovating the rubble of the worst ground zeros you could ever imagine. A God who repairs it and renews it and restores it. A God who is ready to renovate the rubble of your life. And for some of you, God's already done that work and I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me. God is ready to use you to help others begin the renovation he has for their lives too. This is an important morning and it's an important very important message. Ground zero. What is that ground zero at your life? What is that moment you stood with two feet and looked at the ruins of your life? Three weeks, just over three weeks, after rescue crews had sorted through the rubble for weeks and weeks and weeks in New York City, in the midst of gray and dust and brown dirt, in the midst of destruction that they couldn't even imagine, rescue crews on the ground saw something that brought a grown man to his knees. He saw ten leaves of a tree, bright green. Bright green. Ten trees, bright, ten leaves, bright green of a tree, standing in contrast to the gray and dark and brown of the rubble at ground zero. And he got his tools and he started to, to scrape away the stuff and he found a calorie pear tree that for three weeks had laid in the ruins of ground zero in New York City, but it had 10 leaves. It had branches completely battered and torn from the trauma that it had experienced. It had roots exposed, but there were 10 leaves alive. And he called his buddies. He said, hey, guys, you think we can get this tree out of the rubble? And they were like, yeah, we do. And they dug this tree out of the rubble, and they put it on the back of a pickup truck, and they took it to a nursery, a nearby nursery in New York, where it was nursed for a few days, nursed and nurtured back to health, to decent health, for about 10 days. It was watered and cared for, and then it was taken and planted in a nearby city park in New York. It was planted where it was continued to be cared for for 10 years. And 10 years, when the memorial at Ground Zero opened, this one tree that had become known as the survivor tree with 10 green leaves begging for hope, asking people who'd sorted through rubble for weeks and weeks and weeks, asking them to believe that new life and restoration and repairing was possible. And it was. Ten years 
after the survivor tree is now planted at the World Trade Center Memorial standing broadly and proudly. In a few weeks, it's going to be bright orange and red because it's fall, and that's just what, what happens to it. But it is standing proudly at the World Trade Center um, Memorial. And I want you to know this. I want you to know this. The same God who made those ten green leaves visible for rescue workers has ten leaves in your life that he wants to restore. He wants to take your bare and traumatized roots and he wants to nurse them back to health. He wants to take your battered branches and your tree trunk that has experienced way too much pain and he wants to renovate them so that it can stand boldly and proudly. Your life can stand boldly and proudly as a testament of the power that God can do in your life to renovate and make new. This is what Peter a pastor, a fisherman, a guy who was perfectly content doing his job. This is what Peter found out firsthand from Jesus. He's, he's out on a boat fishing one day, doing his job. That's what he did. He's fishing one day, and, and this man comes on the shore, and he says, Hey, Peter, it doesn't look like you're catching too many fish. And he's like, Yeah, it's a terrible day fishing. He's like, cast your nets on the other side, dude. He's like, don't you think I've tried that? Who do you think you are? He said, just do what I say. And Peter cast his net on the other side of the boat. And, and the Bible tells us that there were too many fish to even fill his net and put up on his boat. He just started fishing a little different. And Jesus said, Jesus was the man who called out to him. He said, hey, Peter, I know it's a good fishing day, but this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to drop your nets even on your best day. I'm going to ask you to follow me because I want to use you, just a, just a regular old fisherman, I want to use you to renovate this world into my kingdom. I want to use you and your purpose and your goodness to help make something new here. And Peter, it says, didn't even hesitate. He dropped his nets and he followed Jesus. For three years, he watched Jesus heal and teach and preach and, and care for people. He was at the feet of Jesus. He asked some dumb questions, don't we all? He did some dumb things, don't we all? But Jesus kept using him time and time and time again. Jesus kept using Peter. And then Jesus died on the cross, and he rose again, and he looked at Peter with scarred hands and a scarred side, and he said, this movement... This movement of repairing and renovating the world that you've been a part of for three years, it depends on you witnessing to my resurrection, to me standing here with scarred and wounded hands, but saying that there is possibility of new life, that the greatest renovation didn't happen three years ago or two years ago or one year ago when I healed people or fed people. The greatest renovation is going to continue to happen as you start new churches, as you introduce me and my healing work to new people. Go forth, Peter, with these 12 guys in this room right now. Go forth and renovate the world. Build my kingdom and give me glory and honor and praise for it. And Peter said, I'll do it. I will do it again, Jesus. And he dropped what all he knew all over again, and he did what God asked him to do through Jesus all over again. Some of you are like, Erica, I feel like all I've done is stand at ground zero after ground zero after ground zero. I need you to hear Peter stood there too. Time and time and time again, God promised to offer renovation to Peter and through Peter, repairing, renewing, and restoring. Peter started new churches, and we are going to read a letter that he wrote to a church that was started and they, they believed wholeheartedly in what it was God was doing through Jesus Christ. They believed in the resurrection. They believed God was doing new things. They believed that God was asking them to, to care for orphans and, and widows and heal the sick and feed the hungry. They believed God was asking them to build a new kingdom, and they did it. But then all of a sudden, people around them, the people who they worked for, the people who they went to school with, the people who they lived with, their best friends, all of a sudden they started saying, you know what, we don't really like this movement you're a part of. And so they began to experience persecution. And these hopeless, desperate people began to wear out and exhaust people who had the hope of the risen Christ. 
They begin to wear them out. Anybody here hold on to the hope and power of Jesus Christ, but sometimes you get worn out and exhausted by people who do not believe in the same hope that you believe in, who don't cling to the same love and power that you believe. Anybody here feel worn out by that? That's how this church was. They're, they're worn out and exhausted, and they're tired, and they're about ready to give up. And Peter says to him, don't give up now. Don't quit before the renovation is finished. Let's keep going. And so he tells him something. He says, I want you to work on the foundation, the foundation of your life. That's what ground zero really opens up, isn't it? Your feet stand on the foundation of your life. Can you, can you look around? Can you look around and see what it is what, what foundation in your life needs to be renovated or repaired? I'm going to read these words from 1 Peter. These words we believe in this church, that the, the words we read from here fall afresh on us through the Holy Spirit, that they come alive as they are read here today. And so when I finish reading this, I'm going to say this is the word of God for the people of God. And if y'all will say thanks be to God that these fresh words that Peter wrote 2,000 years ago fall fresh on churches full of people who might be desperate and hopeless and exhausted today. Will you listen? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him. This Jesus who they've tried to tell you is not worth it, he's precious to God. He's living and he's important. He's the cornerstone of your faith is what Peter says to him. You also... You also, you desperate and exhausted and worn out people, you also are like living stones. And you are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture, it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him, the one whose foundation is built on that cornerstone will never, ever be put to shame. You can never be persecuted. You can never be too worn out. God will always be there. Now, now to you who believe this, who believe this stone is precious, but who may have forgotten it, who, who may not believe it completely right now, it also says this, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. This cornerstone it can be rough sometimes. It can be hard sometimes. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. We run from the very thing God wants for us. That's what he's saying. But you, you, look around this room. You, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. No matter what anybody's told you this week or your whole life, you are chosen and royal. You're a holy nation. You are a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now... You are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy and goodness and forgiveness and love and power that makes all things new and renovates even the biggest mess of rubble. Once you had not received that mercy, but now, now you have received it. Pastor Erica, what does that mean for me today? A renovation is about restoring, repairing, and renewing so that something could be made into good and great condition. That's what God's doing in your life if you are sitting here right now. That's what God is doing right now. The foundations of your life are being repaired and renewed. And I'm asking you to think about your foundations today. Listen, I've repaired, I've renovated a house before. I know if you don't have to touch the foundation, the renovation goes a lot quicker, right? When you start messing with the foundation, problems, get, problems they start coming. It's not pretty, and it's going to take a lot longer than you thought it was. But I'm asking you right now to let God renovate the foundation 
of your life. It might take some time. It might take you thinking about it and praying about it all week. It might take you signing up for a small group to join you for the next six weeks and helping repair and renovate your life. I don't know what God's going to ask you to do this morning, but I want you to be open to letting God renovate the foundation of your life that may have been brought bare by the ground zero you've experienced in your life. The first thing God's going to do is repair your obsessions. Repair your obsessions. What is it that you're obsessing about? Because this is what happens when trauma hits. This is what happens when ground zero hits. You start obsessing about the dirt and the rubble. And that's all you can think about. This room's a mess. This, this, this. It's, it's just everything's a mess. My life's a mess. I'm a mess. I'm not worthy. This cornerstone's not worthy. You start obsessing over things. What are other people going to think about this rubble that's, that's laying on in South Tampa? What are people going to think about that, right? You start obsessing about the wrong things. And God says, if you're ready for a renovation, the thing that's going to renovate your foundation is to repair your obsessions. Tell those voices that are worried about the rubble and the ground zero of your life, start telling them the truth. You are a chosen people. You are special. You are worthy of mercy that will renovate and change everything in your life. You're a royal priesthood. God wants to use you to build his kingdom in ways you never imagined. Start telling those obsessions that you wake up with every morning. Tell them the truth, the truth that Peter wrote in here. You are a chosen people. The cornerstone in your life is living and it can't be messed up. Start writing down some promises of God to start telling your obsessions. Repair your obsessions. Start obsessing over the grace and goodness and mercy of God. Start obsessing over his truth in your life. It's changed my life this week. I used to wake up being like, my kids are, are wild. They don't sleep till 7 o'clock. Nobody can pay attention to this hatch clock. I can't fix breakfast that's healthy for anybody. We can never get to school on time. I, I'm the worst mom in the whole world. Everybody in South Tampa sees my Horizon Church sticker, cut everybody off in the car line. I, God, I desperately need a repair. I desperately, anybody else here need a repair? Repair your obsessions. You are a chosen you are a chosen and royal priesthood. Maybe when you cut that person off, they needed to see Horizon Church. Google it. Maybe they're sitting here this morning. Maybe God's renovating something through you. Begin to repair your obsessions. But seriously, the voices in your head that's telling you you're not good enough, you're never going to be good enough, that your work matters way more than it does, that your friends don't care about you or don't like you or you don't have any friends, start repairing those obsessions with the truth. You are chosen. And you are a royal priesthood, and together we're going to renovate this world for the glory of Christ, and people are going to be blown away. Repair your obsessions. Renew your faith. Renew your faith. It's said in here that these folks were having a hard time believing because they were exhausted and desperate and worn out. We can look around and see all the things that are wrong in our lives, our churches, our world, our small groups, our friends, our family, all the dysfunction everywhere. We can start, we can, and, and then we try to believe that or fix that. Or think we can fix that. Renew your faith. The things in your life will not be repaired or renewed no matter how hard you try except through the cornerstone of Jesus. Renew your faith. What has taken the place of the cornerstone at the foundation of your life? Money, an addiction that's trying to help you run away and hide from the things that need to be rebuilt and renovated in your life. What has become the cornerstone of the foundation of your life? Renew it. Let God rip that cornerstone out and put the, put the real faithful thing that will renovate you and this world. Let God renew your faith. Believe in Jesus as the cornerstone of your, of your faith and your foundation and your life and quit letting everything else run it. What is it? What is it that's your cornerstone right now? What is it that's your cornerstone? And how can you let God rip that cornerstone up and your, your life, your foundation, be built again on Jesus, the cornerstone of your faith. Restore. Restore your community. Restore your community. You were once a person all by yourself, but now you're a people, he says. 
He says, when you try to, to fight for me all by yourself, when you try to take on a world who's exhausting you and, and, and depleting you, when you try to do that all by yourself, of course you're losing hope and goodness because you are a people now. You're not just a person. Look around this room. People who believe in Jesus, we are a people now working together for the renovation. It's no longer you out there on your own. Thank God. It's exhausting and lonely to be out there all by yourself, right? We renew our community. I asked this question two weeks ago. I asked people to raise their hand if they were a part of a small group. And I know it's a small, intimate setting, but I'm going to ask you right now, raise your hand if you're a part of a small group. Keep your hand up if that small group has changed your life. Keep your hand up. If, or if you've been a part of a small group that's changed your life. I ask you all, you can put your hands down. Thank you for your honesty and thank you, God, for the work you do in our small groups. I'm asking you this because God does restoring and restoration work. God renovates our lives when we gather with people who will hold us accountable, who will love us and support us and walk with us, who will celebrate with us, who will open this Bible and find out God's truth with us. It will change your lives. It will restore you and renovate you in a way that will, it, it'll blow you away. It happened for four weeks. We had a small group meeting in our house, and me and Chris, like, they left, and we cried. We're like, we want them to come back next week. But we set them out to be leaders of new small groups. And so I'm asking you right now, if your faith has not been restored because you are living life alone, it is time to restore your community. It's time to gather in a small group and let people love you and call you to love God better and deeper. It's time to restore your community. Brick by brick by brick. God will replace us with, I forgot this blank if I'm really honest. Oh, God will replace it with inspiration. I think I didn't delete the slide. That's why. <laughs> that was last week. Uh, but restore your, yeah, we're not supposed to skip all those. <laughs> some of y'all need to replace and demolish some things. Let's, uh, if y'all fill in the blanks there. That survivor tree that was planted in, in the World Trade Center Memorial in Ground Zero that I was telling you about earlier that, that withstood the devastation. Each year, seedlings fall from the trees and a high school in New York City goes and picks up the seedlings and they take them to the greenhouse and the agriculture department at their high school and they nurture these seedlings and, and grow them into these, these trees and then they send them to places that have their own ground zeros. These high school students go and collect seedlings from the survivor tree found at the World Trade Center and they take them to a greenhouse and an agriculture teacher has helped these kids nurture and care for the seedlings of the survivor tree and then they send these trees to places like Newtown, Connecticut, outside of Sandy Hook Elementary School is a seedling of the survivor tree planted out front in the elementary school. Gulfport, Mississippi, after uh, Hurricane Katrina blows through, there's a, there's a seedling of a survivor tree planted in Gulfport, Mississippi, reminding people that, that not everyone survived the trauma of Hurricane Katrina, but those of us that did, God took the 10 green leaves that were saved, and God did something new. Joplin, Missouri, when a tornado come through, came through, the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, Parkland High School, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, as close as Parkland, Florida and Orlando, Florida. The seedlings of the survivor tree continue to grow and remind people of the renovating power of new hope and new life. And I say this because when God renovates your life, just like we sang today, we're never going to stop singing. We can't hold it inside. We don't keep that tree at the World Trade Center and hope it lives forever. No, we take seedlings and we send them to the most hopeless and desperate places and we say there is hope. What ground zero in your life, what story of that ground zero in your life, that renovation that God has done through Jesus in your life, what would it look like for you to take the seedlings of that renovated life God has given to you and to start planting it in places where people are experiencing destruction that they couldn't even imagine or dream of anymore. What does it look like? What does it look like to take the seedling and say, hey, I'm going to dig this up and plant it right here as a, as a reminder. I want this piece of my story to be a reminder in the foundation of your life that God will renovate your life. God will 
make things new. What story, what part of your story needs to serve as a seedling to help someone else in their ground zero moment in life? Every single one of us in here can name the person who's been that for us. We can name the person who when life hit absolute rock bottom, when you sat and stared at the ground zero of your life, someone came by and said, in the midst of this rubble and destruction and despair, I'm going to plant this teeny tiny tree. I want you to know renovation is possible. New life is possible. I bet they've done that for you in your life because the glory of God will not be kept in New York City. It will not be kept in this worship space in rights. These seedlings will be sent out into the world to repair and restore and renovate because that's who God is. And this church believes so much in that. We believe so much in that and so much in the power of God to renovate and restore that we are stepping out into a risky ministry that is super exciting. For the past three years, teenagers like those that have cared for the seedlings in a high school in New York City, teenagers who've... who've, who've tried their best to, to make something of their lives the last three years when school hasn't been normal and life's been chaotic, those kids are looking for a place to come and to know about a God who will renovate the ground zero of their lives. And so this church, who believes so much in over-investing in the next generation, hired a youth pastor this week. Amy, if you'll come on up and y'all give her a high five. Amy... <laughs> As a teenager, Amy sat in a youth group, and the seedlings of her lives were nurtured by a youth group, and she wants to see teens in this community come to know the renovating work that is possible through God because of Jesus Christ. She's going to do this work with us. So I want us to end our sermon by thinking of what seedling, what teenager do you know? If you got to go to Publix right now and find one working and drag them, drag them here, what teenager can you invite into to meet Amy so that we can begin to watch God renovate and restore and renew and repair this city for the glory and goodness of God? It is time for us to shine light and ignite change in a place where there's been darkness. We lived in darkness, and we have been called out into light. And this is a way this church is committing to that. Will you do that work with us? And will you pray with me for Amy right now? God, we thank you so much for the repairing, renovating, restoring, renewing work you've done in our lives. We thank you for the story that you have written in Amy's life and the life of all of the chosen people you have gathered in this room. We pray right now for the seedlings that are, that are being nurtured and cared for. We pray for teens that haven't even come to this church or, or know about your goodness yet, God, that, that through this church's commitment to that, through Amy's work, through our invitation, God, that more and more kids will know about your renovating work through Jesus. We pray boldly and powerfully, God, for your kingdom to come. Use Amy to shine your light and ignite your change. Grow a youth group full of teens here who are repairing and restoring and renewing the world. And may everybody in South Tampa be point at that work and think, God, thank you so much for the renovating work that you are doing in our world. We love you, and we thank you for loving us. Amen.